This is a video in clinical medicine from the New England Journal of Medicine. Pericardiocentesis is indicated as an emergency procedure in patients with cardiac tamponade. Accumulation of fluid within the non-distensible pericardial sac can increase pressure on the heart, leading to impaired cardiac filling and decreased cardiac output. The use of emergency pericardiocentesis to aspirate the fluid can be a life-saving procedure that restores normal cardiac function and peripheral perfusion. The classic presentation of patients with pericardial tamponade includes Beck's triad of jugular venous distension, distant heart sounds, and hypotension. Most patients will have at least one of these signs. All three rarely appear simultaneously and then only briefly before cardiac arrest. Other signs of cardiac tamponade may include a pulsus paradoxus greater than 10 millimeters of mercury, an electrocardiogram with a low voltage QRS or electrical alternans, or a chest radiograph with an enlarged cardiac silhouette. Recent clinical studies report that dyspnea and tachypnea are the two most common presenting features among patients with cardiac tamponade. The rate of pericardial fluid accumulation has a sizable effect on the rate of clinical decompensation. A patient with a rapidly accumulating pericardial effusion may present with severe respiratory distress, agitation, tachycardia, and hypotension before his condition quickly progresses to obtundation, bradycardia, and pulseless electrical activity. Patients at risk for pericardial tamponade include those with metastatic cancer, a history of mediastinal radiation, end-stage renal disease, tuberculosis, traumatic injury, and those who have recently had cardiac surgery. Pericardial tamponade should also be considered as a possible cause of cardiac arrest with pulseless electrical activity. Bedside ultrasonography can be used to identify pericardial fluid as well as features of pericardial tamponade. Practitioners without ultrasound expertise should consider consultation with a qualified radiologist or cardiologist. Pericardial fluid and diastolic collapse of the right atrium and ventricle are diagnostic of pericardial tamponade. A finding of a dilated inferior vena cava without respiratory variations in size further supports this diagnosis. Emergency intervention is required. Emergency pericardiocentesis is not indicated for a patient with a pericardial effusion and stable vital signs, as demonstrated here by the same actor portraying a stable patient. This condition should be monitored and appropriate medical management initiated, which may include a scheduled non-emergency drainage procedure. The combination of a traumatic pericardial effusion and unstable vital signs is a relative contraindication to emergency pericardiocentesis, since these circumstances are an indication for emergency thoracotomy. Although pericardiocentesis can be used as a temporizing measure, the patient will still require a thoracotomy since ongoing bleeding can cause a rapid reaccumulation of blood within the pericardium. Other relative contraindications to emergency pericardiocentesis include myocardial rupture, aortic dissection, and a severe bleeding disorder. However, there are no absolute contraindications in a patient whose condition is unstable and in whom emergency pericardiocentesis would relieve a life-threatening pericardial tamponade. Appropriate universal precautions for potential exposure to bodily fluids should be used when performing this invasive procedure. The materials needed for emergency pericardiocentesis include a code cart and resuscitation equipment, hemodynamic monitoring devices, a bedside ultrasound machine, an electrocardiogram machine, an 18-gauge spinal needle, a three-way stopcock, a 20cc syringe, antibacterial skin cleanser, a wire with alligator clips, and sterile gloves. Before beginning the procedure, palpate and identify the appropriate surface landmark for the immediate subxiphoid approach to pericardiocentesis, the xiphoid process. After donning sterile gloves, quickly wash a wide area of the patient's anterior chest wall and upper abdominal area using an antibacterial skin cleanser. Drape the area with sterile towels. During an emergency, local anesthesia is not typically used because of the time-sensitive nature of this procedure. However, when the clinical circumstances allow, use local anesthesia to enhance patient comfort. The patient depicted here has cardiac tamponade and pulseless electrical activity, 
which requires cardiopulmonary resuscitation and an immediate emergency pericardiocentesis. In a patient whose condition is more stable, consider raising the head of the bed by 30 to 45 degrees to permit more direct access to fluid collections. Draping will not be used here so that the viewer can see the surface landmarks. Ultrasound-guided pericardiocentesis is recommended because it allows direct visualization of the pericardial effusion as well as the needle used for drainage as it enters the pericardium. If an ultrasound machine is not available, electrocardiographic monitoring is recommended during the procedure to indicate when the needle makes contact with the myocardium. A blind approach can be attempted if neither electrocardiographic monitoring nor an ultrasound machine is immediately available, but this approach is often associated with unacceptably high morbidity and mortality as compared to one that incorporates ultrasonography or electrocardiography. Use bedside ultrasonography to identify the pericardial effusion and to guide your approach to emergency pericardiocentesis. The immediate subxiphoid approach to emergency pericardiocentesis begins just below the xiphoid process. Insert the spinal needle with a stylet in place to prevent dermal tissue from plugging the needle. Once the needle has punctured the skin, remove the stylet and attach a three-way stopcock and a 20cc syringe. Advance the needle toward the left shoulder while aspirating continuously. The internal images presented here show the needle entering the thoracic cavity and advancing toward the heart. After puncturing the pericardium, the needle enters the potential space surrounding the myocardium. Using real-time ultrasound imaging, guide the needle toward the largest collection of pericardial fluid. Withdraw fluid from the pericardial effusion by aspirating with the syringe. Removing even a small amount of fluid can lead to dramatic improvements in cardiac output and blood pressure. Once the needle is properly oriented to remove fluid easily, empty fluid from the syringe by attaching tubing to a three-way stopcock. Continue to remove pericardial fluid until vital signs normalize and no further fluid can be removed from the pericardium. The parasternal approach is an alternative method for performing emergency pericardiocentesis. Insert the needle perpendicular to the chest wall in the fifth intercostal space, just lateral to the sternum. Use ultrasonography to locate the largest portion of the effusion that is close to the body surface and guide the needle into the pericardial sac to aspirate fluid. If ultrasonographic guidance is not available, attach a sterile alligator clip and wire to the spinal needle and connect the wire to a precordial lead on a continuous electrocardiographic monitor. As you advance the needle, monitor the electrocardiographic tracing for ST segment elevation, which indicates that the needle has been advanced too far and is in contact with the myocardial surface. If this occurs, withdraw the needle until ST segment elevation resolves, then redirect the needle to obtain pericardial fluid. Blind pericardiocentesis can be performed by entering the skin at a 45 degree angle and advancing the needle toward the left shoulder. Again, this approach to the procedure is associated with a higher rate of complications than when it is guided by ultrasonography or electrocardiography. The blind approach should only be used in an emergency when neither of these two forms of monitoring is immediately available. After completion of the pericardiocentesis, visualize the heart with ultrasonography to confirm the removal of the pericardial fluid and adequate cardiac function. Continue with resuscitation as needed, depending on the patient's hemodynamic response to the procedure. Obtain a chest x-ray after the completion of pericardiocentesis to assess for complications such as pleural effusion or pneumothorax. Continue to monitor the patient for signs of hemodynamic instability and for physical findings that suggest fluid is continuing to accumulate in the pericardial sac. Definitive care may include placement of a soft catheter in the pericardial space or surgical placement of a pericardial window to allow for continuous drainage. As with any invasive procedure, complications can occur. Those most commonly associated with pericardiocentesis are cardiac dysrhythmias, cardiac puncture, pneumothorax, and coronary vessel injury. Other associated complications include peritoneal puncture, liver or stomach injury, puncture of the internal thoracic artery, diaphragmatic injury, and death. Emergency pericardiocentesis can be a life-saving procedure when pericardial tamponade is present. Ultrasound guidance is recommended to minimize the potential complications. After completing the procedure, continue to monitor the patient for signs or symptoms of recurrent tamponade until definitive care can be provided.